Hey, beautiful soul. You're listening to the Rising Into Mindful Motherhood podcast, your weekly dose of fertility wisdom. I'm your host, Dr. Katie Wood. I'm a barefoot mama bear, pharmacist, and integrative fertility coach. This is your go-to podcast for all things to naturally nourish your fertility, embody womb healing, and reclaim your feminine power to accelerate your path to pregnancy. My expert guests and I will be having intentional conversations to discuss the many facets of a thriving, fertile foundation, natural wellness, and how we grow and transform as women on our journey to motherhood. So let's dive in, shall we? Hello and welcome to Rising Into Mindful Motherhood. This episode, I'll be talking with Thalia Pellegrini. She is a registered nutritional therapist based in England. After spending a decade as a broadcast journalist for the BBC, she shifted gears and attended the Institute of Optimum Nutrition in London. She now supports women to address health issues ranging from PCOS, endometriosis, PMS, perimenopause, fatigue, and low energy. In this episode, we'll be discussing how powerful nutrition can be for supporting women on their journey to motherhood. So welcome, Thalia. I'm so excited to have you on the podcast, and I am really curious to hear about your passion behind the decision to jump from being a journalist for the BBC to a nutritional therapist, because that's that sounds like a pretty cool job to be a journalist for the BBC. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Katie. Yes, so I was a TV presenter for the BBC, and I just felt it was time to do something a little different, partly because I was thinking about becoming a mum, and I knew that I was, at the time I was doing a travel programme for the BBC, I was travelling the world. And I knew that just didn't feel right for how I wanted to mother. And I had never forgotten a lady that had changed my life in my 20s. I had like, you know, millions of teenagers. I had glandular fever, which I think you guys call mono, uh, age 17. And I just didn't get better. And this is going back, you know, we're talking the 90s. So I remember a GP saying to me, my doctor saying, you know, it sounds like it's like a post-viral situation but no one really knew more than that and eventually I was diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome and I managed to get through college barely you know I worked super hard but I was never well Mm -hmm. and then one day I was trying to hold down a job in London my first job after graduating and I wandered into a bookshop and I found this book that said how to beat fatigue and I devoured it And at the end was a list of nutritionists and it was a short list, but one of them happened to live not far from where I was living in London. And I went to see her and she was a nutritionist that changed my life. And her work with me meant that I got to pursue my dream of becoming a TV presenter because prior to my work with her, I was not in a good way. I couldn't hold down a job. The, I would get every illness coming, you know, I was super fatigued which gave me anxiety. So I was, it, I mean, it, when I say it changed my life, I'm not being melodramatic. She, in the space of three months, I was a different person and I'd never forgot her. And I was looking for something more fulfilling. And I thought, wow, that would be an amazing thing to do for other women. Mm. And it is. And that was the beginning of my my new journey, my new career. Wow, that is a powerful story right there. I had mono in high school as well. And the biggest symptom I had was fatigue. Like that is all I could do was sleep. Mm -hmm. So if that symptom like stuck with you, I can only imagine how difficult it would be to just live really (laughs) and to have a job and just all those things. So how amazing. And I love just like the serendipity of things. Like you found a book in the bookstore and a nutritionist happened to be in this very short list at the end of the book near you and your life just completely changed. Yeah, I know. I know. I feel like that journey, I was meant to be on that journey. So after I saw her, I pursued my career at the BBC, but I I was always interested in nutrition. I always was really focused on what I was eating and how it made me feel. So I was very connected to food. So it felt like a natural progression when I was ready to, I don't think I acknowledged it consciously that it was a a natural transition for me, but it was, you know, it was just, Mm -hmm. once I thought of it, I was like, yeah, 
that feels absolutely right. That's what I should be doing. Amazing. Amazing. So what does life look now as a nutritional therapist? You know, who do you typically work with? How do you support them and, and all of those things? So my clients are 98% women and they're predominantly in their 30s and 40s. Mm -hmm. And my job is to be a bit of a health detective. Uh, so I'm called the Knackered Mums Nutritionist here in the UK. And knackered is a word I know that's not, it's a colloquialism in the UK. And it basically means exhausted, you know, really tired, so tired. And so what I do for mums is I have their backs in the first instance. I'm a, the person they don't have to be productive for or brave in front of or they get to just be super honest about how they're feeling and a lot of mums will protect that because they don't they fear judgment I completely understand how that where they're coming from with that so my job is to understand why they're exhausted so you would think okay well you're a mum so you're not getting a lot of sleep and you're really busy but of course there can be far more to it than that so my job is to understand what your root cause is what's driving your tiredness is it hormonal is it undiagnosed autoimmunity is it digestive is it post viral i've had a lot of long covid in my clinic mm. over the last 3 years is it perimenopause is it just you are in this transition and you are not doing what you need to for yourself to look after yourself and that's really common Mm -hmm. is that women put themselves at the bottom of their to-do list. Whether you are a, a mother or not, you are likely to be a nurturer. You are likely to put your energy as much as you have it towards everyone you love in your life and not yourself. So it's my job to bring a woman back to a place of self-compassion and show her how to nourish herself both you know, practically, given the time that she may have for herself, and also what other ways, what what else is nourishment? And, you know, nourishment comes in many forms. Yeah, I love all of these things that you're speaking to, like being a stand for them, a safe space for them to really kind of take that mask off that a lot mm -hmm. of times women can wear to really have that brave face and, and kind of the appearance that everything is is okay when really she's exhausted inside, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. I love that you're that safe space for them because- I don't know about in London, but a lot of times in America, doctors, you know, gaslighting is a really huge thing and just kind of dismissing people's mm -hmm. symptoms. Like fatigue is such a common symptom and, and it can be from so many things, like all of the things that you had mentioned. Really, you do need someone behind you doing that detective work instead of just saying, okay, here's a pill, here's a Band-Aid to kind of cover up yeah. this fatigue or whatever may be going on for you. Mm -hmm. So I really, really love that. So what would you say, like, what is the first step that you tackle with people? Let's say maybe, I don't know if you take some labs and kind of do some of that investigative work. What is the first thing that you really start working on with people? So my background as a journalist comes in really handy because the first consultation with someone is really information gathering for me. It is understanding their health history. And I go right back to childhood. If I can, I will always ask questions about their mother's pregnancy. Were they breastfed? How were they born? Childhood illnesses, what we call adverse childhood events. How many ACEs did you have in your childhood? That is very indicative of autoimmunity, particularly for women in, in later life, in adult life. I ask them to fill in a questionnaire, which gives me a sense, a starting point for where I might investigate. And I always ask for some blood work. So I start with chem just some basic blood chemistry that can give me some indication. So if you go to a doctor and your thyroid is within a reference range, which is probably different in the US to it mm. is to how it is in the UK, to Germany, to France. So it's, it's a little arbitrary. But if someone comes to me with blood work and they're just at the top end of a range, say for their thyroid, and the GP has said, you're fine, your bloods are fine. But they're sitting in front of a doctor and they're saying, I, I feel sluggish. I have brain fog. I can't lose weight. My hands and feet are cold. I'm hearing thyroid problems. Mm -hmm. So I'm not just looking at the blood work. I'm saying, well, then maybe we need to support your thyroid because... A lot of women operate at their best around a TSH, a thyroid stimulating hormone of around two. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the UK, the upper limit for TSH is somewhere around five. Uh -huh. So you can have an elevated TSH that's still in range, but you're feeling dreadful. Mm -hmm. So it's my job to really understand what's brought you to this point in your health. And it's and I love that in my job. 
it's because everyone's story is different and I find it absolutely fascinating. That's when I get really excited about drawing together a picture of someone's health and life and well-being and understanding how I can transform their health because it's always different. There's no mm-hmm. cookie cutter approach. Everyone is unique. Absolutely. Would you say that nutrition plays a large role in kind of how you support your clients and feeling better? Absolutely. And I think connection to our bodies and connection to how we eat is a really big issue. One of the things that's really interesting in my work is women's relationship with food. So it's not just about what's on their plate, it's how they feel about what's on their plate. And there's a lot of narrative in women's heads about food in terms of guilt and shame. You know, comfort eating is bad. I'll just have that but I won't have that later. I, you know, I won't eat today so I can have my wine with my girlfriends tonight or, you know, whatever it may be. And that's usually historical. It'll have gone back to childhood. It'll be to do with how their mothers ate. I mean, the stories I've heard in my clinic are just make me want to sob, you know, so we inherit that. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons it's so important, I think, for us as mums to model good behavior around food and when I say good behavior I just mean a positive relationship with food and so that's very much part of what I do so it's your relationship with food and it's what's on your plate it's connecting the fact that food is not just fuel it is information for our cells for our hormones for so much of how we feel and you know our energy each day has, has everything to do with what we put into our bodies what we include and what we choose to exclude as well so it's a process of depending where a woman comes to me you know what what she can she may feel like she has a really healthy diet and she's still exhausted so it depends on her journey but yeah absolutely nutrition is fundamental to me Mm -hmm. yeah you bring up a lot of beautiful points with the relationship surrounding around food and Mm. it is true I mean you know social media and society just puts a lot of shame and blame on certain foods, eating certain ways. And then yes, modeling from your parents as well can be a huge, huge thing that you kind of grow up with and you don't even Mm -hmm. realize it. Mm -hmm. I think another thing too is just like mindful eating in other ways, like actually slowing down, being in a calm environment. I used to work in retail pharmacy and at one point, you know, 12 hour shifts, didn't get a lunch. So eating was very hard. It would have to be, you know, I'd be standing up eating really quick. I could be interrupted. And I think a lot of, a lot of jobs are like that. You don't have a quiet space to sit down and slowly chew your food and enjoy Mm -hmm. it. It's just like, we're on the go. We're eating while we're driving. We're eating while we're talking. And that in and of itself can affect digestion and just so many things. So I think, the points that you work, you know, with your clients on are, are really amazing. So one of the things that, bef- you know, before you and I scheduled this podcast that you had brought up was that you you like to work with couples versus just the woman if, you know, they're maybe seeing you for during that preconception phase. Mm-hmm. And I would mm-hmm. love to hear why that's important. Because it takes two people to make a baby. Mm-hmm. And so... You can be looking at a woman and uh, working with her with no idea if there's problems uh, for the male partner. And we know that there are huge issues for male factor fertility. So my dissertation when I was at college was on male factor infertility and how to improve sperm parameters. So if a a couple are struggling to get pregnant, I want to be looking at his his workup as well as as hers. Mm -hmm. Because if you're helping her, but the problem is with him, we're just wasting our time. Mm-hmm. So I really want, I always invite couples to come to me together so that we can work in a dual way on optimizing their fertility together as a couple. Mm-hmm. And again, it's just really common for women to feel that responsibility to take that mantle on themselves. And that can be very frustrating. Not, you know, men don't always want to work with, with a nutritionist because they see it as restrictive. They don't want to hear, you know what, it might be really valuable if you restrict your alcohol intake for the next three mm-hmm. months. But women will, you know, tie themselves in knots doing everything they can because they want to have a, you know, they want to fall pregnant, but actually the problem may not be with them. And of course, I'm not just working towards a pregnancy. I'm working towards a healthy pregnancy all the way through 
and a healthy baby and a healthy child. So we know from research that first thousand days is super important. So we know so much more than we did even 10 years ago. And so there's so much we can do with dietary and lifestyle intervention. So I would say it takes 12 months to make a baby. We want that three months prior to conception to really optimize your health as a couple. So that is always my invitation. I love that you did your dissertation on male factor infertility. That's that's amazing. Yeah, you bring up such a valid point and I see it very often within my own clients, women in my community, is the fertility phase really gets put on the woman's shoulders. And I have worked with women, I, I refuse to do it anymore. But in the past, I've worked with women where the, the partner wants nothing to do with changes whatsoever. And it is kind of like you're spinning your wheels and you're you're running in place because it does take two. The sperm yeah. has a lot to do with the health of the placenta and so many other things. Mm -hmm. So when you, you know, start thinking about miscarriages and whatnot, I do think that being a stand for women to advocate even to their partners and not just their doctors, but, you know, getting that sperm analysis and getting their partner to take a vitamin, or like you said, maybe limiting their alcohol. I've had someone this past year who had to basically stop their cannabis use in his sperm changed quite drastically. It went from yeah. you're basically going to need to do like IUI or IVF to yeah. he stopped and then it was back. to normal. Yeah. And that's, that's what's frustrating in a way because we can do so much in three months for men with some really targeted supplement intervention and some lifestyle changes. We can see massive differences. Yeah. massive and like you say it's about risk of miscarriage you know if we i always test for dna fragmentation so we want to be thinking about infections undetected infections i recently looked after a couple who'd been trying for two or three years and she actually came to me with chronic migraines but she said i want i want to get pregnant and we're not falling pregnant and we're on a list of waiting list for ivf and i we i supported her her migraines were gone within three months we got rid of her migraines and I said, let's focus now on your fertility, but we need to speak to your partner. And he did not want to be part of it. So she managed to get him to reduce his drinking and we got him on a couple of supplements. They had IVF. I did a lot of work with her on her vaginal microbiome. And that made a big difference to her, her likelihood of holding on to a pregnancy because she had miscarried before. And their first IVF failed and she came back to me and she said, I, you know, I'm I said, don't, you know, it's your first round. It's, it's going to be okay. Let's keep that good work going. Mm -hmm. And she contacted me three weeks later to say she was pregnant naturally. She'd fallen pregnant wow. naturally. So I think it can be, you know, when you, and I've been there myself, when you want to get pregnant, you just want it to happen yesterday. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it can be such a long process, but it's it always, it's always worth, I think, looking off, looking to yourself, but also encouraging your partner to look to their their health as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a couple of things I want to touch on there. One is talking about that 12 month period making a baby, especially prioritizing that three month period, which, you know, egg development, sperm development has that 90 to 100 day period. So really, that is very important to take a minimum of three months. But I also like to drive home the point of you know, the healthier you're making your body, the healthier environment you're creating for your baby to grow in. And that's going to have an effect on them on their life when they're here and living and their overall health outcomes, too. So like you said, just kind of taking a step back. I also understand wanting to get pregnant yesterday, too. But, you know, taking a breath, taking a step back, working a, with a practitioner like yourself or, or someone like me, depending on where you're located in the world, and just, you know, allowing your journey to really mirror to you where you can be healed and kind of do better for yourself and your life. And, you know, in terms of postpartum as well, yeah. you know, the healthier you are when you get pregnant, the healthier your pregnancy is likely to be and mm -hmm. the better 
the better you will be equipped to deal with your your health postpartum is likely to be recover faster you know there's so and if you understand um, how to nourish your body when you become a, a mum there's a few you know there's just some basics you might have in place that you may not have done otherwise you know all of these things are so important we're so focused often on on getting pregnant um but we want to play the long game and we want a, a happy healthy mum because there's nothing more important the happier and healthier a mum is you know everything follows you know it, it everything funnels through a mum and when she is vibrant and happy and rested which isn't okay rested is a challenge in, in new motherhood I'm, let's be honest but it, you know everything ripples out from her so the happier and healthier she is the better always absolutely now, you had mentioned vaginal microbiome earlier, so I'm really interested to kind of learn more about what it is you're testing for, things you're finding, treating, and just a little bit more about that, because that might be a newer kind of aspect of fertility that some of the listeners might not be familiar with. So it's one of the workups I like to do along with that blood chemistry, you know, testing thyroid, for example, is really important. We want, an, a, a, again, a TSH of around two before we think about conception. And then the vi- vaginal microbiome, it's a, you know, it's a low, it's not a very invasive procedure just to do the test and it's quite low cost. And what it shows me is it's going to show me everything from pH. It's going to show me if there is high levels of certain bacteria, lactobacillus may be particularly low. We want lacto, there's sort of four lactobacillus we tend to see in the vaginal microbiome. We want key ones to be optimal. We want to make sure that there's, you know, if E. coli is elevated, we want to get that down. So it really just gives a picture of the environment. And, and there's so much, again, we can do with targeted probiotics that we can use either orally or you can apply and insert that makes a big difference to potentially to the work that we do together long to, longer term. And often if we retest, we can see that all the parameters have improved. So that's just an additional layer of support for, for pregnancy, conception and pregnancy. Yeah, beautiful. Yes, a, a mentor I'm working with right now, she is also really, really diving into the vaginal microbiome and has found that there are certain strains that are actually like anti fertility. Mm. So it is definitely something to take into consideration. Yeah, absolutely. But there's there's so there's so much we can we can do. So I think it's important that we don't get, you know, if you come to if you come to your conception journey and you're healthy, you just want to do the best you can for your body, that's great. It's often when I've got clients who maybe have been trying for a long time or there's been some repeated miscarriage, we're gonna dig a little deeper and see what might be going on. So what I don't want women to do is to get overwhelmed by the things that can go wrong or can be a problem. When we start out, we're doing a little basic blood work and we're going to just work on how we can optimize your egg health if you, as a woman. How do we is you in, you're getting enough protein? What's your antioxidant status? Are you eating lots? Are you eating the rainbow? Are the healthy fats going into your diet? You know, what is your, what are your periods like? So I always say to women, your period is your report card. What is it telling us? So if you come to the point of wanting to conceive and you've been on the pill for a long time we know that the pill creates a lot of can create deficiencies of certain b vitamins magnesium so we want to address those if you are have had period problems if you have heavy bleeds or pms or period pain pms and period pain do not need to be your normal so let's address what might be driving those things let's resolve those before you you try to get pregnant so i don't i'm not really comfortable with the phrase hormonal balance it's a little simplistic but i think it's when i talk about hormonal imbalance what i'm really saying is you're struggling or you're suffering and you don't need to be what Mm -hmm. can we do about that Mm -hmm. yeah Beautiful point on earlier what you were saying, not getting overwhelmed. Not everyone will necessarily need all of these deep digging findings and everything yeah. like that. But I do think it's good to know what's available to you and be informed. So I would love to hear a little bit more on some of the free offerings you have for the listeners. I know you mentioned a couple. Well, I like to support a woman's energy 
because I think energy is everything. It's not just about how we feel when we get up in the morning. It's about how we come at the world. It's about how we interact with the world. And so I always talk about how can we support your energy? And the first thing I always do with my clients is I say, let's talk about your breakfast. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about how you nourish yourself with that first meal of the day. So one of the things I have is a free breakfast collection and it is um, recipes that are ready in five or 10 minutes or less. So we can all find that time in the morning, even if some of them are meals we can prep ahead, five minutes prep, but ready to grab from the fridge on the way to work but just to make sure that we have that nourishing meal, the first meal of the day. So I have a, a recipe collection. I have a free Facebook community called the, the Nourish Mum Meetup. And then I run free events three or four times a year online with a replay. So if you can't make the live sessions, depending on where you are in the world. And I have sessions, I have challenges, I call them challenges five days where it's just really getting you to focus on your well-being and to inspire and empower you to make small changes that will make a big impact on your on your day to day and i have my next one will probably be in march and that will be the the secrets to happier hormones so that's really about perimenopause if you follow me on instagram or you sign up for my newsletter which i, I send out every two weeks there's always a recipe there are lots of ways to be in my community that, that cost you nothing so i'm very happy to share all, all the ways to do that with you Amazing. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. And if anyone is interested in working with you, where is the best place to contact you for that? Everyone who'd like to work with me can make a booking for a free call. And that call just allows us to see if we connect, allows me to better understand what your health challenges are and what you'd like to achieve. And then we can explore whether nutritional therapy is right for you. So I can give you again, the link for, for someone to book that call and, and chat to me or just reach out on email. Beautiful, beautiful. Do you have any final words for the listeners that you'd like to share? I always invite women to hold their well-being sacred, mm. to nourish themselves without guilt. And I think when we do that, everyone benefits. I really believe that. So we shouldn't be, it's the last thing on our to-do list. So I always say to women, ask yourself each day, what in what way, in what small way today can I nourish myself? And that might be, a phone call with a girlfriend you haven't spoken to. It might be a walk for 10 minutes somewhere green and beautiful. It might be, you know what, it might be a bowl of ice cream and your favorite TV show. It might be going to bed a little earlier or that nourishing breakfast, but I would love you to invite every woman listening to think about how she might nourish herself today and tomorrow. Mm, I love that. And I love this conversation. I think that planted a lot of healthy seeds for that preconception period. So thank you so much, Talia, for being on and sharing with us. And yeah, it was a great show. Thank you so much for having me, Katie. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Rising Into Mindful Motherhood podcast. If this episode resonated with you or gave you an aha moment, stop what you're doing right now and write a review. This simple act of kindness helps me get this podcast out to connect with as many women as I possibly can. I also have a special offer. If you send me a screenshot of your review, I will take $250 off one of my premium coaching containers. Let me know what resonated with you the most and why. So connect with me in my free Facebook community or tag me on Instagram. You'll find both listed below. Thanks again from the bottom of my heart for tuning in to this episode and I'll see you next time.